Hello, my name is Nathan Holman, uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about quantum characterization of a six-dot exchange-only qubit array in the Sledge architecture. The outline of the talk is as follows. I'll briefly remind the audience what an exchange-only qubit is and why we like them here at HRL. I'll then go into the Sledge device architecture and how we use it to do tune-up and control of these qubits. And then I'll focus on the uh, qubit characterization and error budgeting. Um, specifically detailing axis miscalibration, charge noise, and magnetic noise in these devices. There are, of course, other uh, characterizations that are of interest but are outside of the scope of this talk, and I encourage people who are interested to see these other talks um, for more details. So the exchange only qubit, it's a way to do an encoded single qubit um, using three exchange-coupled spins. Um, the way we enter this, uh, what we call decoherence-free subsystem, is by initializing two of those spins in a singlet state leaving the third spin as a gauge degree of freedom that we don't need to initialize. Um, the added cost, of course, is that we need three dots and three spins, but we gain full qubit control using only the exchange interaction, which looks like voltage pulses on our exchange gates, so-called X gates. Um, so we don't need microwaves, micromagnets, or intrinsic spin-orbit coupling to do spin control. Um, and f the other nice property for these qubits is that for single qubit operation, Exchange pulses cannot force us to leak the DFS subspace, um, which is a really nice property. Only magnetic noise can make us reach these leaked states. So the Sledge device architecture is how we actually implement this. Um, Sledge stands for Single Layer Etch Defined Gate Electrode. Um, and as the name suggests, it is a process where we etch all of the surface gates into a blanket layer of titanium nitride. Um, to actually bias voltages on these, uh, volt on these metal islands, we bring down metal vias from above in order to electrically contact them to the outside world. Um, this single la uh, layer fabrication greatly improves our qubit yields because of a clean dielectric and gate metal interface. And for our one by six arrays, what we try to do is form quantum dots under each P gate and control the barriers between the quantum dots using the X gates, as illustrated in the cross-sectional SEM at the bottom here. Now, these vias allow us to route our backend control wiring on a separate layer from our gate electrodes. And that's really powerful because it will allow us to reach, in, at least theoretically, uh, 2D topologies with these quantum dot arrays that really weren't possible with previous technologies, um, such as the overlapping gate architecture. Um, if you want to see more details on this, I encourage you to see Mike Dura's talk or read our recent paper. I'm going to take for granted that we can reach the appropriate charge state, but if you want to learn more about how you can automate such a procedure, uh, Reed has a nice talk on that as well. So, exchange, how do we tune it up? Well, as I alluded to earlier, we apply voltage pulses to our X gates to raise and lower the barriers to turn on and off exchange. But we can't just do that. We have to apply compensating pulses to the neighboring P gates in order to stay in the correct charge cell. The way we do that in the lab, uh, or you know, measure that in the lab, is we take what's called a non-equilibrium charge cell. This is just where we apply a fixed X gate voltage and no P gate compensation and measure exchange oscillations that are centered about the 1, 1 charge cell for a given axis. As you can see in the plot here, if we apply no compensation, we'll end up in this red dot but by choosing the appropriate P-gate compensation for this fixed X-gate throw, we can center ourselves well about the 1-1 one, one cell. If you don't do this accurately, um, or don't do it at all, uh, you'll end up with a mechanism that we refer to as T1J. Um, and Edwin Acuna will talk about this more in his talk. So once you've figured out this compensation matrix element, you can then do a compensated X-gate throw versus detuning sweep, what we call an exchange fingerprint plot. What you see are singlet triplet oscillations as a function of gate voltages for a fixed evolution time. And each uh, exchange oscillation fringe um, corresponds to a certain angle of rotation. So every dark fringe trough corresponds to specifically an odd multiple of pi rotation about that axis. Generally, we uh, optimize our symmetric axis by choosing a direction to throw the voltages to maximize our exchange quality factor, what we call NOSC. If you do a voltage sweep along that axis, what you will see are the characteristic chirp exchange oscillations that are a hallmark of the exchange-only qubit. We can invert this and uh, extract an angle rotation map uh, to voltage, uh, which we use to calibrate all of the angles we need to do randomized benchmarking. If you can do this for two adjacent axes, um, we can do what we call blind randomized benchmarking, which is a leakage-sensitive form of randomized benchmarking. 
And indeed, in an optimized setup for this device, we're able to get single qubit errors down to 1e minus 3, with about a quarter of that error due to magnetic noise. Um, so I said you need two axes. How often can we actually do that? While we're still gathering statistics on these devices, Sledge does afford a higher what we call fingerprint yield, as can be seen in these three devices. They're not all from one hero chip or wafer. They are spread across several fabrons. Um, and it's critical that we have this high yield for one and two qubit benchmarking studies. So how do we use this to budget our error and understand our error sources better? Well, first we need to write down the error model. Uh, for randomized benchmarking, there are several things that you want might guess. Axis miscalibration, one over F charge noise, or hyperfine defacing. Um, there are some more exotic things that you might uh, speculate on, such as Johnson noise from our room temperature electronics, or this novel T1J mechanism. In general, we can predict the trends of these errors, theoretically, but the coefficients for each of these terms are hard to pin down, theoretically. And that's due to the fact that they're sensitive to the exact noise model and control sequence used in the experiment. So we really have to use these yielding sledge devices to validate our error models. So as I said, axis miscalibration is one of these terms in this equation. Misrotation is expected to be an exchange-like error, and so we anticipate it to affect our RB error, but not our leakage. We can probe this in the lab by varying our angle of miscalibration, and indeed we see a good match to the theoretical model, down to the coefficient value within a few percent. Um, this also bounds our intrinsic miscalibration at below 1%, placing a randomized benchmarking error bound at the few E minus 4. As I mentioned, charge noise is of course present in our devices, and even with our optimization of the symmetric axis to maximize our exchange oscillation quality factor, we still end up with a Q uh, between 30 and 70 for a 100 megahertz J. This corresponds to a T2 star of about 500 nanoseconds. As you can see in the upper right plot here, um, this is characteristic of a single two qubit device um, and is fairly uniform across the array. Theoretically, the coefficient for this term is bounded above by one, um, and this allows us to just use NOSC to put an upper bound on our RB error. Um, in this case, uh, for our typical devices, it puts us around 0.3 to 1.1 E minus 3. We can't easily change NOSC in these devices um, at the optimal operating point for a fixed J, but we can vary J. And as we see in this plot here of NOSC versus our exchange frequency, uh, the oscillation quality factor goes up slowly and then explodes uh, as we hit about 20 gigahertz. You can understand this um, by looking at the fingerprint and seeing that we pulse deep into a highly aliased exchange regime that we call the super dot. Um, what this really is, is you're, you've completely eliminated the tunnel barrier between the two, dot, uh, two electrons, and now you have a two electron single dot picture. Um, and there, your J asymptotes to a fixed value that is the singlet triplet splitting of this effective quantum dot. Um, this is an important regime for uh, cavity coupling measurements, and I encourage you to see Sam Quinn's talk on this. Lastly, uh, we do have magnetic noise in these devices, despite some isotopic purification. We can do standard uh, T2 star measurements, and we observe a coherence time of 3.5 microseconds that we believe are due to the residual spin nuclear spins in the device. We can emulate this in randomized benchmarking by sweeping the idle time between our pulses. And indeed, we see at long idle times, our RB error tracks closely with our leakage error. And this shows a, a nice way to reduce the amount of leakage error we have in the device, just idle less. And additionally, um, by optimizing our magnetic uh, field, we can reduce the amount of leakage we have in the device by roughly a factor of two due to the fact that we lift some of the degeneracy of the leakage subspace. So to recap, Sledge affords us an architecture that we can do reproducible one and two qubit studies. I've demonstrated how we can measure various noise sources and budget the errors associated with them and show that our error at 1e minus 3 level is limited by charge and magnetic noise in the device. If you are a US citizen and you find this interesting, I encourage you to come talk to us. Uh, we're hiring across the board. Thank you.